to go. Yeah, we got people floating in. Yeah, people have have appeared. Ah, how do I? There we are. <clears throat> yeah, these are always uh, as I was <laughs> as we as like as we were you know because we met we met you know what, last last week sometime and then I was like oh nothing much has happened in the world of security in the last you know week or so. <laughs> yeah, it's like. <laughs> What are we going to talk about? You know, <laughs> oh, ransomware. Now that's a thing. <laughs> Oops. I was, I was, as I was coming, getting ready today, I'm like, are we, in, are we in a mode now? You know how, like in, in, in the, in the olden days, you'd have, um, you kind of marked your calendars the first week of August that zero days were going to drop, right? Right around yeah. DEFCON, right? That was the, that was like what you measured against. It seems like now it's like, you know, between Christmas and New Year's, or I mean, uh, Christmas and Thanksgiving is kind of the, uh, uh, you know, big, big drop. We'll maybe have to start marking our calendars for that. <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel like I can't tell peacetime from wartime anymore. It just seems like, constant is like all right this is the new cadence and by cadence i mean every every day we, <laughs> yeah, yeah. we get something new and fun yeah exactly. with uh working with ir firms over the last few years has been really eye-opening and that like it definitely as an outsider to like when terrible things happen and having to deal with them for a long time um definitely always seemed like it was concentrated more around the holidays and stuff like that and it probably still does even simple phenomenon like every like Friday is the day apparently that everyone decides we can't do this ourselves call an IR firm and so like like it right. seems like almost every Friday sometimes kind of feels like a groundhog yeah. day a little bit where it's just like all right that's when like that's when the shoe's gonna drop and uh and then this stuff piles on right yeah it's yeah. like you like pen testing firms. You better have staff staff up for Q4 because everybody's like, uh oh, that thing we're supposed to do. What was right. that thing? Yeah. Well, <laughs> what we've noticed uh, in in the past um, is that we get a larger amount of support calls. Friday afternoons at like three o'clock because that's when pen testers are getting all their reports written. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. So, well, hey, everybody, welcome to our webinar. We are excited that you, you've joined us. Um, we'll go ahead and get, get it kicked off. Um, we tend to kind of let people trickle in for a few minutes, but we've, uh, we're have we excited to kind of share about um, Beyond Trends today and, and talk about practical insights of things that we learned in 2021 and observed and kind of how that, how that parlays into 2022. And we were just uh, early joking on about nothing much has happened in the last week in the security space, so we might not have much to talk about, but um, really excited that, that everybody has taken some time out of their day to join us. Um, I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and and kind of kick it off with, and I'll let these other fine gentlemen introduce themselves. But I'm I'm Dan DeClaus, um, the founder and CEO of PlexTrack. Uh, uh, if you're a current customer or you know in our sphere, you, you've probably seen me talk before. But uh, if not, we're, we're we're glad you're here and and uh, excited to have Keith and Adam join us. So, Keith, Adam, take it away and introduce yourselves. Sure. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll go, uh, we'll just go left to right. Uh, it's, I'm Keith, uh, like one of the founders at Red Canary. Um, and, uh, yeah, like longtime friend, uh, to, to varying degrees with these two gentlemen. So like, I'm uh, looking forward to, uh, looking forward to adulting a little while together. It's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> Uh, well, hello everyone. I'm Adam Mashinchi. I'm the director of open source programs over at Red Canary. And so I'm you know, deeply involved in things like Atomic Red Team and the like. And I was all for this webinar until I heard we have to be adulting for the next hour. And, and right. now, like, that's <laughs> a requirement. That. I might just bail out of this thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, no, uh, uh, it's been a it's been a fun and interesting year, uh, to say the least. And so, um, you know, that's that's just really what we're, you know, what we like to do these kind of end of year webinars, and we kind of like to put a different flavor on them, right? We like to put a different flavor like, hey, well, let's just not talk about, hey, we're going to see more ransomware in 2022. <laughs> and we're going to see more APT in 2022, right? And, and here's what we saw last year. But but I think, you know, we all have a good perspective on, you know, what, is, what are we seeing in the world, right? In terms of like, yeah, there's always going to be ransomware. There's always going to be APTs and, and, you know, whatever else in the, in the security space. And there's going to be emerging technologies that are going to continue to get hacked. There's going to continue to be large 
global impacting uh, zero days that get dropped that you know people people lose a lot of sleep over a weekend to try and assess the damage. Um, and I think there's, I think that, I think we want to kind of address that today too, in, in terms of both what both of our companies, you know, are, can see, you know, in that, in that perspective as well. But, uh, you know, what we like to do is kind of say, here's, here's the trends that we saw both from the offensive and defensive security space and, and where we see people going and how to, how to mitigate risk and, and, uh, approach their like security program from a proactive perspective perspective. So, so that's really what we've got lined out for everybody today and, and really excited about the, the conversation. Um, so we'll just dive right into it. I guess, yeah, I kind of already highlighted the agenda. Sorry, I didn't move the slide around, but uh, these are always open uh, for Q&A along the way. And we'll try to address if it makes sense to address the question in line, we'll go ahead and do that. Otherwise, we'll hold those to the end. But uh, feel free to use the Q&A portion of the, the Zoom uh, webinar. And we'll make sure we try and get those addressed uh, throughout the course of the hour. Um, <clears throat> but uh, again, really excited to have everybody here and uh, let's dive in. So, so I, first off, I'd love to kind of see, you know, like what your guys' perspective has been of like what we saw in 2021 and what were some of the key themes uh, even, even in the last week? Oh boy. Uh, you. <clears throat> All right. So I'll, I'll take a pass at it. Uh, I'll, I'll, throw myself on the grenade. The, uh, so, uh, I mean, there's a whole bunch we saw in, in 2021, I would say, you know, if we're kind of thinking um, like a little less threat specific and, and maybe like a little bit more, um, you know, like a slightly higher level, like things that, uh, yeah, <laughs> this is great. We're, we're off to a strong start in chat, everybody. Way to go. Um, so, uh, what we did see, and like you know, maybe if there's a you know a slightly different twist on what we saw, um, yeah, we saw a bunch of things that we expected, right? We saw um, obviously like we saw ransomware. We definitely saw like the marketplace for that um, become more mature. Um, we saw like the tooling and kind of the ecosystem that those adversaries use. Like it, it evolved in like a lot of the ways that we expected. A couple that we didn't. Um, the you know, the really obvious thing that, that we saw last year, I think, was that um, you had, you know, we always like to say things like it's always fishing. And I think statistically, it's probably still always fishing. Um, but, you know, some of the, you know, new vectors in particular, like having to become much more concerned with uh, with remote access systems, um, either ones that were, you know, left open has hap haphazardly or ones that had, you know, really specific vulnerabilities and just like adversaries, um, ability to identify those and to like really mechanize their approach to finding them and exploiting them was interesting. Um, maybe the last thing I'll say from like Greg Canary's perspective is that we, um, a really interesting thing that we observed was that like detecting most of that stuff, even though some of those vectors were new and were really unique and some of them were very closely pinned to like two emerging exploits and things like that, that we otherwise couldn't have predicted. Uh, I will say that, like detecting those things, like a lot of detection kind of like primitives and fundamentals um, were still really, really effective. It doesn't mean they're easy, but like, uh, you know, being able to successfully detect those things, even when you actually, you don't really know what you're looking at some of the time, you just know it's not right. Um, that was an interesting trend, right? Just thinking through like retrospectively, um, you know, the types of detection and the approaches to detection that were that were really, really effective, even in the face of like some of these things that were that were very new and like very unexpected. So it's, and it's interesting, especially when you're looking at the scope of like ye olde detections, like things that we were looking for two, three years ago, and all of a sudden they'll light up out of nowhere. And it's like, wait, why is this a ye oldie malware like come online again? <laughs> like, why does Conficker still show up today? Because somebody plugged in a USB drive they'd forgotten about. But more importantly, like when we see new pieces of ransomware or whatever using the ye oldie tactics from years ago, and those detectors still fire happily. And that's something that is like, oh, that's neat. We're not all just wasting our time. And it's not all just like looking at the bleeding edge of compromise, right? And that's, I think that's really uh, something that's compelling to see looking back on 2021, like, oh, 
the old way, like the old stuff we were thinking about still works because people still try to use that. And that's neat from a industry like industry perspective like your old detectors are still valuable don't just purge them because they're old right. yeah yeah exactly yeah <laughs> you never know when you need it right or and and then and then if, if you do purge it you you get burned by not having it right so it's yeah. like of course of course it's kind of no i mean i think it's interesting you know I, I would agree i think what what we've observed you know from our perspective is is a lot more of the hey we've got a lot of data Right, and we've got a lot of things that we know, you know, we're we're able to detect, uh, but we don't have a, a really good uh, uh, way of continuously monitoring how how our our defenses are working or how our controls are, are effectively uh, being able to detect some of these you know known techniques. And I think um, what we saw, you know, was definitely a, a, a larger emphasis on kind of what I would say getting getting back to the basics and getting back to the fundamentals of like, hey, we need to be doing continuous testing. We need to be identifying you know, the key gaps, right? We've got a lot of tech. We've got a lot of data. What are we, you know, what are we actually focused on from how is this configured correctly and how is this working? Um, you know, because, because of things like, you know, the, 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 the ransomware that hits the pipelines and, you know, brings, you know, affects the economy for a few, few days. Right. You know, I mean, I think people could trigger like, Hey, the Southeast definitely got hit, <laughs> you know, like with the gas prices, right. Or things like this. So I think that's, what's interesting is that, you know, we're seeing a much more, maybe not, maybe not a more global impact, but definitely more global awareness. Right. Uh, you know, for those of us that have been in the space the longest, or a long time, you know, it, it, this is not news to us, but I think for a lot of people in the world, it's it's becoming a lot more visible, right? And and actually, I think you, like the way you say that, you've brought up one of my favorite, like things that happened in this last year, and it's supply chain issues. And, right. the, and to double down on it, it's this conflation of terms. So if we all work in the InfoSec industry, we say like, oh yeah, the supply chain issues, we're like, wait a second. Are we talking yeah. about software supply chain and like bad yeah. updates being bad? Are we talking about actually like boats still on the ocean that can't come to the port? And right. actually, congratulations, world, both things are intertwined now. We're like bad, bad update server serves ransomware to boat server. And now the supply chain issues have caused supply chain issues. And the conflation of these terms have made it really bonkers to talk about some of this stuff here That's in 2021. Weird. And like... You know, there's, no, there's nothing anyone can do about supply chain issues. And it's that focus on post-exploitation detections. Like it's just a doubling down on that. Because yeah. else, like, what else can you do about those sorts of problems? Yeah. And, and, and well, yeah, I, I predict that lots of marketing and lots of companies will will help you in the coming year uh, resolve your supply yeah. chain issues. But um, <laughs> so, and, you know, I, I'm not sure whether, you know, whether it's so much like not being able to do anything, but it, it's definitely interesting. You know, I, I remember just chatting when we were prepping for this, just thinking about the fact like, um, you know, coming from a background in like government and DOD and intelligence, right? Like supply chain issues are and have been like really, uh, particularly in like technology space, right? Um, have been concerns in that industry for a really, really long time. And like, they're very real concerns like, where there are very real occurrences with very real impacts and uh, like just seeing that come downstream to the, to the point that like effectively every company now to like some degree is at a minimum, they're talking about it and more and more of them every day are trying to figure out what to do about it. Right. And so I think that's like, um, you know, in the same way that really high end like malware and things like that, like they all started in the same places and those techniques eventually find their way out into the public, you know, one way or the other. And it's been, has been interesting seeing stuff like supply chain, which are really old problems, even in technology, very real, like very, very hard to, to deal with. Right. And like, they're extremely, like they can be really costly to detect and they can be even more costly to try to mitigate. And so, um, that is an interesting just kind of like evolution of this stuff is like malware, like, you know, um, you know, lives up here in the fraction of the 1% who have to like make it worry about it, use it. And that eventually becomes mainstream. And, and this is no different. Right. And uh, I think that's probably like, you know, when you think about like burden on industry and on us, right. That's uh, 
it's a super, it's a really interesting challenge, right? Like it's effectively an unsolvable problem, but like we absolutely have to dig in and figure out like not how to make it go away, but like we absolutely have to figure out how to make it better. And uh, so, you know, that's a little bit of <laughs> a little bit of last year and definitely a little bit of like what's probably going to be many years to come. Right. So. Yeah. Well, you know, while we're throwing out buzzwords, you know, Adam alluded to it, but you know, I think like the whole zero trust thing, right. You know, becomes a little bit more apparent when you have supply chain issues, both, you know, from, and even, and even like the log for J thing, right. Because it's yeah. like, Hey, if, if, if we get hit with a zero day or, you know, like a trusted, a trusted provider gives us, you know, things that now have a vector into our network, we need to be able to, to to detect the other activities that the attackers will, you know, and 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 uh, you know, hackers will be doing in the environment in order to to determine compromise, right? I guess. Yeah, the- no, I, I think these sorts of things will. We're going to see a tale of log for J, right? We're going to have people are now. I mean, it's already happening. People are grepping all of GitHub for wildly used repositories that have similar flaws. Like now that this has been identified, it's we're gonna find more of this sort of thing. And it, there's that's the nature of widely used libraries. Like they're just embedded all over the place. And what can you do about it? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's, I think it's tricky because uh, Keith, you're, you're right. Like the uh, whole let X vendor solve your tri- supply chain issues with Y piece of software and X, you know, N amount of dollars. Like we're going to see a huge uptick in that certainly. Um, but th- and, and may not be a prediction, but to me, it's only a matter of time before we see a, uh, a widely notarized uh, incident where there's a supply chain issue and it's not because of some third party compromise. It's because some lead developer got a duffel bag of money and told to write a line of code. And mm-hmm. I mean, again, there's no automation you can wrap around that sort of scenario where someone's just getting bribed to put in bad updates. And I, I think I mean, it's certainly happened already uh, in smaller places, but I, I think we're going to probably see a mainstream news like, oh, that was bad and somebody did something criminal and now everybody's freaking out about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. No, I, well, it's interesting that you say that. Cause like when I was in graduate school, which is becoming many, many years ago now, that was a topic of discussion. Like someone did a research paper, like their master's thesis was like, um, how, how, how much, how minimal amount of code could we write a backdoor, <laughs> you know, that, that doesn't get caught, right? You know, it, you know, it, uh, sadly, it, it's not that much, <laughs> right? So uh, it, it's interesting that you bring that up. So, yeah. And, and we look at things, what was it? Like go to fail. I mean, that was a way, that was a while yeah. ago, but like literally like a one liner, it's like, oops. Yeah, <laughs> mistakes were made, um, yeah. but you know, I, I think I think this sort of thing of uh, human caused supply chain issue will probably appear in a meaningful way, and whether or not the rest of us know about it, uh, we'll see. But it, it should prove interesting as a as a vector into organizations, and obviously, if it's something critical to the infrastructure of the entire internet, just everything will burn to the ground over a weekend, and that'll be fun too, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we, t- we talked about kind of supply chain issues that we saw. Um, we talked about kind of some of the defensive measures that we've seen people taking. Is there anything else that you guys would, would highlight in terms of like what we saw in 2021? Um, Cause we can then, you know, we can certainly shift the conversation, but I'd be curious if there was anything else that, you know, you saw as major themes uh, both on the atomic red team or the red canary side. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, maybe the one that, uh, is probably like, you know, the, the biggest softball, uh, like observation of them all. And then like, maybe, you know, as we think to moving towards, you know, things we expect to see next year is that we have, um, their, you know, detection in general, like, seems like it's like concepts, like detection engineering is a concept is a thing that you see more folks like advertising for and like aspiring to, to do, um, doing in some cases. And, uh, and like, you know, those foundational principles there that you see just becoming like much more widely adopted, right? Like building things that are testable and repeatable and measurable. And uh, in particular with testing, right? Just like looking at growth and stuff like 
projects like Atomic Red Team over the last year has been, um, and I say growth, not just, you know, like wild explosion of people. And there's been a lot of folks who have joined the project, but even just like how, like, like just the sheer number of people like that are using that, the places that's getting integrated into other products. Um, and that's, you know, part of that is like very atomic red team specific, but I think like really like the bigger story there is that like, you're definitely starting to see an increase in, you know, a, or a shift from like red teaming used, like used to be a big bang thing that like to Adam's point, like you, like you kind of like, Oh crap. And you do it in Q4 because somewhere you committed to doing this once a year and like people will yell at you if you miss it. Right. And, uh, and it was, a lot of it was compliance driven. Um, not to say organizations didn't like have a desire to do that and learn from it, but um, starting to see stuff like testing and like just companies recognizing the need to make sure that like detection and their operations and their incident response machine works when it matters and like trying to figure that out before it matters um, has been a really like that just overall is like a, a, I think a super positive trend that like we've seen a market increase in, in 2021 in particular. Um, and just the uh, people applying a lot more rigor and a lot more ongoing effort to that. And again, just like thinking of testing as like much less a big bang thing and much more of a thing that you see people building in like to their program expectation of their team every day, week, month, however often they can sustain it. So like that, um, and it just, you know, kind of just sign of overall maturity, right? Like we're all getting a little bit better at this and that, that piece in particular, like that's getting better in some like really, really cool and healthy ways, um, that just lead to like really fundamental improvements across the board, which just kind of like raises all ships and, and makes, makes everyone's life like a little better and easier. So. And if I may, the other, I think the other side of that coin, uh, is really, the lo lowering the barrier to entry for doing regular testing. It's not just the, we have to co hire a pen tester in the Q4. It's we can use things like atomic red team or how the breach and attack simulation space or the adversary emulation space or whatever you want to call it. Like that is being commoditized and that yeah. there's a, such a robust suite of different kinds of products and they're baked in all sorts of different things. And they run the gamut of capabilities like the commoditization of breach and attack simulation as a mechanism for doing detection validation. Uh, I mean, I think 2021 was a huge year for that. It's just not only do we see like all the open source EC2s appear, which we do every nine days, it seems like nowadays, but but really these these products in the in the adversary emulation space are just so good and and numerous. It's really like if anybody wants to do this. They don't need to get a cert to do it. They just can't now, which is awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, and I think, I think that, was, that was one point I was going to bring up. I'm glad you brought up. You know, I think we saw, we saw a, a huge uptick in people wanting to at least start getting one into that continuous mindset of testing, right? And validation, right? Whether you call it controls validation or, you know, pen test as a service or breach and attack simulation. I mean, these are all different flavors of the same thing, right? And I, so I think we've seen that that continue to focus on, hey, this needs to be constant um, in some capacity, right? And 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 a lower barrier to, barrier to entry, like you said, Adam, of having a lot of resources now available to be able to to have this mindset. You know, we we talk about purple teaming a lot, and people can abstract that or make that much more. Uh, um, you know, much more technical and deep than uh, you know, just depending on how you how you think about that term. I always like to think of it a little bit more abstract, of like just general better collaboration and deeper collaboration between people that uh, are are identifying things from the proactive side and the people responsible for fixing them, right? And 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 having a, a I would say a deeper empathy towards um, you know towards being able to say how each side of the fence operates, right? Because <laughs> it's easy as a red teamer, you know, or a pen tester to just, you know, <laughs> blow things up and say, you've got problems, <laughs> you know, and not really know from the blue team's perspective of how hard it is to fix those things, right? <laughs> so, yeah, good stuff. So, well, yeah, no, I, this I, great conversation. I mean, I think, you know, this, this was 
healthy in terms of kind of setting the stage for like what we saw in 2021. And it's interesting even thinking back to like this time last year, you know, what we were talking about, right? Solar winds had just come out. Um, I feel like there was one other one that was, had hit pretty, maybe uh, when did Kaseya hit? I, I don't know if it had hit by this time last year, but all these kinds of things, right? Supply chain, and it's just continuing to trickle in. Um, so like, I think that that helps kind of parlay into the next kind of conversation of like, you know, now what should we expect? You know, we saw some uptick in a lot of these areas. What what are some of your predictions, um, you know, as we head into the new year? Ooh, what should we expect? Um, the, well, um, I think we kind of already, like, we already hit on the obvious prediction, which we, we can absolutely expect all of, like, the end of year events. Like, I mean, honestly, like, from a industry perspective, like, the first part of last year was dominated by people, like, on the tail, like on the tailwinds of things like, um, uh, like just like solar winds, like all the exchange stuff that went down, things like that. And there was, there was just this huge groundswell of activity and people trying to not just sell, but some of that was a huge part of it, but just like a lot of, like a lot of energy was put into figuring out, like, how do we make sure this type of thing doesn't happen again? And then that kind of like tails off and, uh, you know, we could see that again. And I think like maybe by way of just like thinking through, like not just what we expect to see, but what we do about it. Right. There's like an interesting um, and how we can help. Right. It's like one of the most uh, if it's both a prediction and maybe a suggestion, it's just trying to think through as an industry, like, yeah, like what are some of the, like, what are some of the fundamentals that will like, not just help address these tactical problems, but that will make like detection and response. And, and in particular, like how you close the loop on those things much more effective. Right. Um, like that is, and I think that's definitely a thing we expect to see, right. If people are doing more testing now, if that's a hypothesis, which may or may not be true, but, um, but if that's what's happening, like, you know, we've talked a, a whole bunch of times and like, Dan, like you're, you're close to this, right? Like a huge doing the testing is great. And seeing that kind of evolve, like testing tools, maturing that ecosystem, that market, um, and that it, like the availability of that information. Um, now what we want to see is people doing a great job at like incident management. And in particular, like the stuff that you do and that happens, whether it's a actual, like, a purple team or a red team test, or whether it's a surprise test, uh, as we like to say. Um, so, um, but taking those in important steps on the end to really just like understand root causes and figure out how to address some of those fundamental, like those fundamental flaws and in infrastructure and things like that. So like that, um, hopefully that trajectory of testing follows through to just like overall better incident management, incident response, and, and that whole like, it's kind of a virtuous cycle if you get it right. So, yeah, and and I, I think to to dovetail off of that, it's you know asset management. We talk; it's the least interesting part of anyone's job. Uh, configuration management and asset management, the least interesting thing that anyone can do, but wildly effective, <laughs> as it turns <laughs> out. Like you know, and we we again we don't want to talk too much about like log for J, but. Like a mat, th th this thing is a needle in a haystack enough. If you know what you have instead of your infrastructure, if you don't have that either, like how can you begin to know if one wacky piece of software has this dependency? If you don't even know what software you're running, right? Or what servers you have. And, it, and it's, it's unfortunate that literally every year we say, you know what's still important? <laughs> Asset management, configuration management, as it turns out. And so, but it is that fundamentals ball, right? If we can get this right, as it turns out, you know, you can, you can actually help yourself a lot, save yourself a bunch of time. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's interesting, you know, because I mean, that was like, you know, I, I effectively started in the, in the department of defense, you know, security program management was effectively what I started doing my career in. Right. And that was like literally the first thing that we tried to tackle was like, how can we be tasked to protect something we don't know we have? Right. <laughs> and here we are 15 years later, maybe, uh, maybe more like 17 years later now, but, <laughs> but like, yeah, and we're still having the same conversation, right? And it's just more complex. It's different. I think that's always going to be something that's, if there's one thing that's always going to be really, really hard, 
but really, really important. It's what you just said, right? Config yeah. management and asset management, right? Um, you know, so, the, so but uh, on the, you know, maybe following through the infosec nihilism thread here for a second, <laughs> right? It is. Uh, like, <laughs> I'm definitely a, you know, I'm a glass half full person, but I do, you know, if there's, if there's some good there, you're right. Like we've been talking about a lot of the same stuff for a long time. Um, and I think there's also like the, like the basics are like, they're basic and like they're inarguably important, but they're real, like they're really freaking hard. Right. Uh, inventory asset management, like really freaking hard and like grow like and the chant like the complexity grows exponentially as the company grows right going from 20 people to 200 like um like you've got 10x the the problems that you had um like not just in like terms of people like or just systems but it's like that complexity just balloons like like crazy and so there's so on the one hand yeah that's true like the you know, I, I do think, and you know, maybe even just kind of like piggybacking on Adam's observation, like breach and attack simulations getting better. That's awesome, right? That's a good thing. It kind of lowers the barrier of entry for that. Like more people can do it. The other cool thing that happens is like those breach and attack simulation companies can start focusing on like really hard and unique problems, right? And um, and and not focusing on like a lot of the kind of like really like low hanging fruit or table stakes approaches to that stuff. And so. Um, you know, hopefully the same thing is true when we think about like inventory and asset management, like just as just to pick on that one space, but it's like, um, like we, that we can actually, like, we may be able to focus on that now. And, and, and a part of the reason will be because like the fundamentals, like we've got like application control and things like that, or that are really moving upstream, like more of a, an app store and like tightly a controlled approach to like what goes on to devices. Right. And like, um, like those things, like, yes, we've got some new challenges, supply chain stuff, really, really hard, like software bill of materials, really cool idea. That's going to be really hard to make it happen. Inventory asset management, really hard. Um, those problems didn't get easier, but we absolutely, like, I think we're making more space for them, which is great. For, and so, you know, um, when I pick on infosec nihilism, it's that like, yeah, like we are still talking about some of the same things, but like every year we get closer to being able to make really good, like meaningful progress on them, yeah. which is cool. And that's because like a lot of the stuff, application manage, like, you know, application control might be a really good example. Like application whitelisting was for the 1% of the 1% for 20 years, right? Like way, and now it's a feature effectively of everything that you buy. Right. And so, um, I don't know, that's like, uh, just trying to eject some optimism in this conversation and not that you all are being grounders at all, but it is like, well, it's definitely easy to kind of fall into that pit of despair. Yeah. It's like, it is really hard. Well, and, and we're I, making great progress, which is yeah, freaking yeah. awesome. Right. Yeah. You know, and I, and I, and I was going to say, like, I think, I think one, I don't think I, a, I don't think if you were to just go say, I'm going to go solve our asset management problem, you're never going to do that. Right. But I think, I think it, it, I'm just saying like, I think that that's going to be a, I think that's going to be a, a, an effort that you'll eventually reach this point of diminishing returns where you're trying to, uh, trying to identify every single possible like asset. Not that it's not important, but I think, I think the way the industry is starting to adapt uh, is that we're helping solve those problems in other areas. And that's, I mean, that leads me back to that proactive assessment mindset where, you know, like people that people that will identify assets you didn't know about are pen testers, right? <laughs> you know, and, and other attack, attack scenarios, right? So I think that, that it helps, you know, continue to say like, hey, we think we've got a handle on this, but what are other gaps, right? And, and, and really shifting into a proactive mindset um, I think is I think is it going to continue to be a, a trend um, in 2022? Whether that's through breach and attack simulation, you know, you know pro. I mean, aut pen test automation, as well as you know, combined with your, you know, your your internal and external pen testing teams, just more proactive. I, I think probing even deeper from like a, an audit and risk risk management perspective. I think people are are starting to wisen up. And I shouldn't, that's, that's probably the wrong term. I mean, like, you know, people are starting to, to, to go a little bit deeper, 
right? Like, hey, you say you're compliant. You say you do these things. How are you doing that? And 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 not in a not in a like an accusatory way of like, let's really make sure we know what we should be doing um, to try and help avoid that big thing happening. <laughs> it's like uh, it's like Moore's law, but for like detection and response and stuff. Like <laughs> if there's like a like a security operations equivalent of that, it is. Yeah. Uh, that's a cool thing to think through and like hadn't really like occurred to me until you said it, but it is, uh, you know, if you kind of think about the fact that like we are starting to get some like fundamentally better controls in a lot of places and testing is becoming more readily accessible and some really cool companies are starting to do work in really hard areas like inventory and asset management. Um, not for the first time, but I think like we're moving the needle for the first time and, uh, and that's like, you know, all that stuff for like, if you want to talk about conversations we've had for years, it's that like, you know, the adversaries like OODA loop is definitely been faster traditionally than like defenders. Right. And, uh, and it feels like we're like, we're getting there, right. Like we're starting to tighten the loop on just like getting better at things faster. And like, that would be a really, really cool thing to see, like take hold and to kind of keep an eye on um, like that's, like that because that's how like that's how you make like fundamentally like like really huge like revolutionary change and not just yeah. like hey it's get like one percent better every year like we need to get 10 15 20 percent better like every year right it's like that's like a survival tactic now <laughs> it's like so and I, and I think for better or worse vendor consolidation is actually a big boon here right like as as large, like super vendors get more and more tools in their toolbox and acquire more companies and do more things in once. Like, oh, well, your EDR is now also your asset manager and it's also your SIM and it's also all these other things. And it's like, well, it just makes everything that much easier. And then because when super vendors get this way, we have that benefit now of like, oh, this one customer got compromised in a really bizarre way. But now there, there's detections for it. It's fed up into this larger ecosystem and bang, everybody's blanket detected. And so that, you know, <laughs> the monopolization of vendor tools and resources into these mega corporations that are really just here to protect people and make, you know, and also make money. But like that as a thing, as more, as more and more capabilities get packed into a single tool, um, that's pretty neat. There's some uh, there's some compelling use cases that can be driven out of that, and it just makes the defender's life that much easier, theoretically. Yeah. Well, and I like how we're I, I like how we're starting to normalize and, and kind of standardize on like more like more standard communication around how we talk about detection and and attack. You know, like uh, the minor attack framework, I think, is a fantastic example of you know, an open framework that, that really resonates with the community of like, this is, this is how we can now speak to where we might have gaps, right. And what the attackers are actually doing. I mean, you know, um, and that there's, there's just a community behind it. I mean, obviously that's, that's, I think a large focus of atomic red team, right. I mean, is just being able to speak to those things. Right. Well, and, and I think that's another both reflection and prediction right there is, this ability for us to be, as an industry, to be adversarial minded and to think about adversaries and quantify them in certain ways and give them like literal technique IDs and batch them together in that way and to be able to translate that across organizations. I mean, that's been a huge win. Uh, and, and now when we talk about vendor integration, it's like, well, does that thing speak MITRE ATT&CK? My thing speaks MITRE ATT&CK. We just need to you know, is it XML, RPC, or JSON now? And, you know, we're done. Like it's th these sorts of conversations, I think, are really critical that we're, we're from a tooling perspective, everybody's really starting to speak the same language more and more and more and more. And that only benefits end customers and end operators. Yeah. And, you know, there's like, a, there's a commercial here, I think, for, um, <laughs> for, you know, I, I would say like, um, there's like miter for starters, like, and, and like how that flows down into things like, like vendor tools and like atomic red team and all of these, like, just kind of like this whole groundswell. And like you, you know, we've had miter as this, like, you know, kind of like great common language for, for now we can like, we can start talking about the same things using the same words. And it kind of just, it, it like gets rid of a lot of the ambiguity. Um, 
and confusion. And now you like you see, you know, you see miters starting to like mature that stuff and how they think about it. And so like we, you know, we put out a threat detection report every year. And it's just like a lot of that is a focus on like straight up prevalence, like not what's interesting, even though that's a component of it, but like what are you most likely, like what is most likely to happen? And in particular, like what's most likely to like to harm you and to have an impact. And and it like lots of folks put those out, right? Like there's like DBIR and M trends and all of these, right? And those now like can structure around that common language. And now like you're looking at MITRE who's like breaking off some like really big and cool projects right now and into next year to help standardize the language that we even use to talk about prevalence, right? And like now that's like huge unlocks where we're not just talking about like things adversaries do using the same words, but when we say, Hey, like, you know, these are the top end techniques, um, in this context or in this environment or targeting this technology, like standardizing that language. And like that unlocks a whole bunch of things, right? Like you can assign value to the data that you collect and to the tools that you buy that help mitigate those things. And you can really like assign value and quantify red team and purple team exercises and all the motion that goes into that, you can focus them in like really different ways. And so like that stuff super, that that's really cool to see, like not, you know, the language evolves, but also just like how we all like use that language to make better decisions and better investments. Like that is like, those things are like, you want to talk about like revolutionary changes in the industry. It just like, it levels the playing field mainly for consumers who are just trying to figure out like, what the heck do I buy? And like, how do I, how do I think about the value of things X, Y, or Z? Or even for like a CISO who's like, I don't know, what do I invest in? And how do I assign right. value to teams A, B, and C? And like, those are, those are super, super exciting to see happening. Right. Well, as, oh, go ahead, Dan. Yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah. 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 Oh, I was going to say, so as we drift into kind of an executive mindset, um, I, and I don't know if it's a reflection or a prediction, but one one of the things we've seen about investment, right, investing in security, um, you know, we've we just kind of in recent times saw the cybersecurity insurance industry split out ransomware as its own thing. I and that to me seems like it's going to have a lasting impact in the way money gets thrown around inside of organizations. Um, you know, to date. When we look at some of the largest cybersecurity incidents, it's like, oh, we just were compromised in the biggest possible way. The board says, here's a blank check, never let this happen again. But now if we look at the cyber insurance market and now that they've split out ransomware as its own thing, I, I'm curious what you all think will be the in, the long tail impact of those as we look at 2022. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that actually like tees up what I was going to say. I mean, I think, I think we're going to have deeper conversations at the stakeholder level, right? And, and being able to um, quantify to a degree, you know, where the risk actually lies within the organization with better data, right? In terms of like, here, here are the actual gaps that we have in, 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 in the fact that you can now do ransomware emulations, right? And simulations in your environment, you can actually even speak to that because yeah, I mean, like the insurance companies, you know, <laughs> they, they have data that shows, hey, we're paying way more out on these insurance policies based on ransomware attacks than anything else that's getting reported. So that's gonna be, that's what's gonna to drive it. I think that's a good, I think that's a good call out. And I think when we can standardize language across the whole industry and not just verticals, I think that that's important, right? Um, so that, that, that then security professionals at, at large can quant help and can start to quantify the risk to the, to the board and to the directors and stakeholders where budget should go and, and, and things like that. So uh, I, I completely agree. The like the insurance angle is fascinating because, you know, like we're all basically in the risk management business, I guess. Right. But like there was always this. It was kind of like a really hard calculus, particularly if you're advocating for like really maturing and improving your defensive posture and your ability to do that, like security operations and things like that. Right. Um, because it was always like, well, you know, like we'll invest in this to a point and then we'll just insure against the rest and insuring against the rest is like becoming increasingly narrow, right? Uh, like 
so there's ransomware, which is split off, I think just last week, right? Like Lloyd's, who's I think still like, you know, one of the biggest insurers in the world. Like they, for the first time, kind of like defined like what is cyber war and like, how, like and they're not like, you know, they've started to back away from covering things like uh, attacks, like orchestrated by what they consider to be like nation or state adversaries. Right. And so like you're like insure against the rest is getting harder and like incentive to mature. Like when all these things we're talking about, right. Like breaking off inventory asset management, like going and doing testing, like incentive to mature fundamentally, like that's going to grow like crazy because like the thing you counted on to save you, if you didn't invest, like, that's just slowly like we're learning more about the costs and uh, and business is business, right? And so like you're increasingly on your own. And uh, you know, I think that like approach where if you invest a little bit more in maturing in those fundamentals, like um, like you said, stakeholders like the board and at like the CFO level and stuff like that, like they like that pressure is very real now, right? And like the consequences are are pretty clear. You know, and I think uh, maybe not a completely conflated use case, but a very, very similar one would be an M&A activity and just diligence from investment, right? Um, uh, you know, we're both venture-backed companies, so we have to go through diligence when anytime we get an investment round. And, and then obviously when, you know, companies are acquiring other companies or having merger activities... There's obviously, there's probably documented and then uh, undocumented, a lot of, do, un, probably a lot of undocumented cases around how co- some of these bigger, bigger breaches might have happened, you know, based on ac- activity on the acquisition side. And so I think, you know, similar to like the insurance being able to try and quantify the risk, I think that M&A activity and, and people doing diligence on investments, uh, I think that's going to be a, this, a similar similar vein in terms of how they're going to speak about it, how they're going to talk about it, which, and, and I, I, I have at least one anecdotal case, use case of a friend of ours that um, they went through uh, an investment round as a startup and um, uh, you know, like the, the price of the deal, like the valuation they got actually went down, um, uh, based on some of the security, uh, issues that, that were uncovered and they were not a security company. Right. So it was kind of all new to them, right. As they're just, they're just building a startup, right. And solving a, a problem in their own, in their own space. And then wait, what, <laughs> what were we supposed to be doing? And now we, you know, don't get as, don't get valued as high as a, as a, as a company. Right. That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it's not awesome. But yeah. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's good that it's being I don't know if about, awesome right? is the word like, I would use. Um, conversations happening in places they didn't before. Right? Yeah. 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 Uh, in a similar vein of interesting but not awesome, the the, <laughs> the increased use of extortionware versus ransomware, and like the use of exfil as a thing. It's like I don't even need to encrypt your stuff anymore. I'm just going to exfil to wherever, and if you don't want this in the wild, money, please. Like that is a very interesting, uh, I think that's a really interesting trend. And it, it's it's more than, it's, it's a little less turnkey for a threat actor, I would imagine to a certain extent for now at least. But like that's business impact right there. Is, is, what is your IP worth? What are these private emails worth to you? And it's not that, you know, your business isn't limping along now. It's not that every file's gone. It's a threat actor was here. They took all of our stuff. Now what do we do about that? Right. And, and that, I think it's very, that's a very vertical specific problem, probably more so than not like, you know, uh, but I, I think that we've, we've seen ransomware kind of drift towards that extortion where, where, and I think that's probably going to increase as well. And the impact of that, while we're talking about business problems. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was, I was just going to like, I was on a <clears throat> chat with a customer the other day who had this fascinating observation that like, you know, they've had a DLP program for 10 or 15 years, right. Or something like that. And like, they're again, like kind of like app whitelisting, like they're in the financial industry, they were doing all this stuff before it was cool. And, um, but it never really had like the groundswell or the importance that it has now because of what you just described, Adam. And like, you know, you want to talk about like, you know, we say flipping things like just go do inventory and asset management. Like we also say flipping things like, oh, like understand where your data is and tag it and know the value of it. Like cool, cool story. (laughs) Turns out that's impossibly difficult for almost every modern organization. And, uh, but like, 
also another really good example of like, those are like, really like, that's a fundamentally hard thing to do. But now like people, like it's important for the business to answer questions when someone says, Hey, X, Y, and Z were taken. And like, if you're a CISO or like a trust officer, like being able to answer that, like to respond to that by saying, yeah, like here's the value of X, Y, and Z. And like, I, here's my recommendation, but like having some basis in like data and some like rigor behind that, like, I don't know if that's going to happen next year, like maybe bookmark that for next year's <laughs> webinar, but like, yeah, <laughs> but it is again, like conversation that was never like, not never happening before, but definitely not happening like in anywhere, but like the top few percent of organizations. Right. And like, yeah. just not even an option. So, well, I, Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. yeah. No, you first. Oh yeah. No, I, I mean, and I think, I think converse, the conversations that are shifting, I mean, like, let's take the log for J thing, for example, I think, you know, I think it's not so much, uh, you know, how quickly are we patching this? I mean, there's always going to be those questions like, Hey, we need it. How, what's our, what's our, you know, attack surface with this and how quickly are we getting it patched? And what's the meantime to resolution on this thing? That's something that the stakeholders are always going to want to know, but I think it's also, how are we able to detect the, the, the activity if it were popped? Right. I mean, because that's just like the initial vector in. And I think that, that I think we're going to start seeing more of those questions, which I think, I mean, it, it, you know, kind of, you know, it, it, it tees up like why we're talking about this in terms of like proactive assessment and having data behind like, hey, we think like if they were had gotten in from this type of a vector, we've done assessments that would simulate that kind of attack, whether it was a known vector or not. Um, and, and so you can at least speak to like greater or less assurance of like, no, this is going to be really bad if they got in this way, or there's some gaps that we need to make sure we're, <laughs> you know, identifying right away versus like, well, we don't know if they're in and, and we patched it. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, well, no, I mean, yeah, that, that's the thinking of the fundamentals ball. Like here we are talking about you know, do you properly label and identify what data that you have in case it's extorted from you or whatever, but like, let's boil it down. Would you notice if somebody started X filling gigs of data off every endpoint in your infrastructure? Like, would you even know? And if the answer is probably not, like you can't even begin to talk about APTs. You can't begin to think about threat actors that use jitter and delays of 40 days and like, Forget that. Like, would you notice if somebody was stealing like 50 gigs off of every endpoint? And if the answer is no, uh, maybe right. there's worth worth a thought. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe start testing that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, no, this is great. You know, we've got about 10 minutes left or so. I, I was like to kind of say, like, hey, if you got any any questions um, from the audience, uh, we'd love to know them. But I mean, I think we can just kind of keep keep chatting about like, you know, I saw George throw in like, you know, uh, the, you know, the question around, uh, you know, <laughs> is everyone going to have this patch by January, 2022? Uh, you know, you know, Keith, I like yours, like how many times, right? <laughs> like fair question yeah. at this point, right? It's uh, yeah. yeah. Those are very real problems, right? So, yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Well, and, and I think it is really interesting to look back while people are thinking of questions to look at back at the uh, the impact of some of the O days and N days that we saw this year, especially, you know, obviously Log4J is an easy one, but like, look at the iMessage stuff that's come out. There's been a few of them and it's like, no, no, no. It's not that the user needs to click a thing anymore. Like someone sent them a thing. Yeah. Game over, right? It's, just, it's we're beyond like phishing at a certain point and it's just, the, the, the degree of these O days are so critical and the users require nothing. It's just, just like, oh, I had a phone and it's yeah. compromised because it received a thing. Like, <laughs> that's crazy. That's it's crazy. Scary. Yep, yep. One thing I do think I think we can talk about too is, you know, I mean, hey, these are the predictions. These are where we see the trends going. But like, what are some practical ways that, that people can, what are some practical things that people could take away from? I mean, yeah. You know, I mean, I think obviously coming from a, a pen testing background and a proactive assessment, you know, I'm I'm evangelizing that all the time, right? Is that hey, we need to we need to constantly be more proactive um, in 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 how we're thinking about 
what activity can go on in our environment that could get us breached um, and then helping the response team understand those document the IOCs, all of that stuff. I mean, I think there's a lot of resources out there. I mean, I think obviously Red Atomic Red Team is a great one, um, but but getting into that uh, that mindset of you know take just start small somewhere, right, and just start doing it and and starting to identify. You know, we call it the purple teaming concept. You know, being able to say like, hey, I think I have a gap here. Right. And I can go I can go pull down some TTPs to test for MITRE Atomic Red Team or, or uh, you know, other tools to just say, like, hey, here's what we're going to test. Did we see it? Did we see anything happen right on the responsive side? But, yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, but so I mean, I think that, that that's just something I always try to like emphasize to, to folks of like, you know, ways to get to get a little more proactive if they haven't, if they haven't started yet yeah. without having a full, like uh, without having a full blown pen test. <laughs> yeah, and it is, it's staggering. Like, you know, I, I, one of the first questions we always get from an atomic red team perspective is like, okay, I want to, I want to start with something, right? Like where, where do I go? What do I do? Where do I start? Um, and, and, and I think the threat detection report is like the place I always point to is like, Hey, would you notice if one of your users, you know, on any of your endpoints, cracked open a, a command prompt and did some encoded PowerShell. Like that's the no, the top the tip top of the iceberg. Like, would you notice if Steve in HR was running encoded PowerShell commands, right? Because if you wouldn't, there'd be dragons. And I think that fundamentals ball that you're talking about, Dan, of like you know, and anybody can do these tests now, any of them. Yeah. So why not like? You could, you could all do this with copy and paste. It's that easy. And there's enough resources to help you get started with it. It's a, hopefully we see a bigger uptick in that as a thing. Um, yeah. yeah. Even is, you know, integrating like that's taking that simple data. I mean, Dan, I remember like one of the like recent conversations we were having, which is, you know, like inside of, inside of your space where people are doing, you know, like purple teaming and you're trying to synthesize like, stuff a red team found or st like stuff you like, but also like feeding in your actual incident data and, and then like vulnerability management and like even just the synthesis of like, Hey, what's most likely to happen or what's most impactful, like particularly like things like a technique standpoint where there's like something really concrete you can point to. And then just in all of these other ecosystems that used like that historically haven't taken like, threat prevalence or technique prevalence into account, right? Like vulnerability management has typically been focused on like, is it exploitable, actively exploited? Like there's been a small number of ways to carve up like those otherwise huge data sets. And like now just being like having the power of like platforms and stuff like that, where you can say, hey, like, yeah, this came up in like in the context of vulnerability management through some like goofy scan that you're otherwise like you have no idea how to prioritize other than some of those like big buckets. But now you start to layer the stuff in and be like, Hey, and by the way, like um, this technique is like, is widely prevalent in like successful intrusions and breaches. And now you can help people. It's just like another dimension on like that data. And uh starting to bring like some of the stuff you learn on the defender side, the stuff you learn on the red team side, some of the motion from like big expensive activities like bone management, um, like synthesizing that stuff together is like absolutely huge. Right. And like, that's a, that's a really, really cool and like positive thing to see happening. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, we've got a few questions. I got, I like this one that just came in. How does a smaller company, like with a small IT staff begin to add blue team activities into their day to day. Right. Um, I, I think, you know, I'll speak from my experience uh, when I was at a smaller company before I started Plex Tracker, like these dove in full time was, uh, you know, we had, we had, we had, you know, smaller team, but we had some good investment in a lot of the defensive technologies like, you know, firewall, we contracted with an MSSP for, for 365 coverage, you know, or at least monitoring. And so, but we kind of sat down and we said like, okay, we're going to spend, you know, 25% of our time on the proactive stuff for now. And we want to shift that percentage up as we kind of, what I call, you know, you know, kind of 
clean out the the backlog of the of the legacy issues and you know we just said like hey we think we have some gaps in like lateral movement detection so like let's just start testing some of those techniques to just see where we're at um so that's that's what we did from a very practical perspective i'd be curious like what you guys advice would be take your vitamins man like that that's the advice right is uh like that's a that's an awesome question right um you say stuff like incorporate blue team activity, blue team activities. Sorry, I like marbles in my mouth. Like that sounds huge, but what you just said is like just pick one thing. Like I don't care if it's like our threat. Go pick anybody's threat report. Like find the stuff that happens most often. Go to Atomic Red Team or to wherever. Figure out how it happens. Like how do you actually make this technique go boom, and do it, and like and just write it down and like literally that simple like that is a super interesting and cool like you can do that during lunch every day and you can see like did i even see the thing happen to the, in the first place did i get an alert did like a preventative thing go off if i have mdr or whatever like did somebody call me and tell me hey we got a problem like super cool way to just think through like how to how to do that and just like really bite size like peak chunks right you don't need a team to do that like awesome way to think about it. It's just like anybody in it can do that. Absolutely. Mm. Anybody. Yeah. And, and I think one thing specifically is you don't need to use like live like bad samples of malware. Like right. I, I'm, I'm glad to see that the industry is kind of not doing that as much anymore. Like as talking about a positive trend, we don't need to use defanged samples of stuff. Like don't, don't go there. Just right. go use the prevalent techniques and see if you notice them. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, in like, you know, I mean, even even like if you're a PlexRack customer or, you know, want to want to do it like there's there's resources out there. I mean, obviously, Atomic Red Team, MITRE has the threat emulation plans, you know, Site even puts out there, uh, you know, Threat Thursdays. So there's there's just free resources out there to go and just and just you know, establish like a a cadence of like, Hey, we're going to go test these things. And then, and then you can actually start to measure your progress over time. Right. So yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Um, Let's see. I think we can do, well, I guess we're right at that. (laughs) We're we're out of time. (laughs) (laughs) I lost track of track of that time, but Hey, um, any, any last uh, one, thank you so much guys for taking, taking time out of your busy schedules as we near the end of the year um, to kind of just spend time reflecting and then looking forward, I, I think this is always valuable for the industry and community. And um, any last things that you like want to share? Anything exciting going on from your perspective that you want to, you know, uh, p- broadcast uh, beyond, you know, Happy New Year? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a slow week and a slow year, so nothing else to add. No, but yeah, thanks, <laughs> thanks a lot for uh, for having us on. Yeah, fun. thank you, Dan. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, well, thanks everybody. I mean, um, from the Plex Track side, we've got some other resources out there. We just published a report on just the value of purple teaming. It was some research that was done. So, feel free to go out to the website and and get that white paper on on how how people are are utilizing purple team in their environments. Uh, very very in the same uh, you know very apropos to our discussion today about being more proactive and and identifying. Uh, how to make progress in, in your security posture. But uh, um, uh, if you if you have any other questions, don't, you know how to reach us and we're always happy to answer them. Adam, Keith, thanks so much and uh, definitely wish you happy holidays and a happy new year. Thank thanks. you, Dan. You too. All right. Thanks Here's everybody you. and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>